The Night Stalker on Netflix. Now, let me begin by saying that I am from Oakland, California, the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, some of some of his killings actually took place there. Then he moved to uh, L.A. and, and uh, started his killing spree. I also should mention that I'm from Oakland, but I moved to El Paso, Texas a few years ago. And not only do I live in the city where he was raised from the from his where he was born here and then from the age of twenty two he moved to California, but I live in his neighborhood. And um yeah, his high schools are uh, I've seen his high school numerous times. I passed by there a lot of times. I never knew that's where he went to high school. And you know, when they spoke about his upbringing, his environment, all the drugs he was into and shit. Yeah, sounds about right. I mean, everywhere you go in the United States of America, especially in the big cities or any city, it's a lot of drug use, right? But it's a lot more prevalent here in El Paso, Texas, because you got the border. So the drugs are cheap as hell on the other side. So people from here go over there, get it cheap, bring it back. You know, and... um there's this sort of isolation, this isolated feeling here. Because if you look at El Paso on the map, there's not another major city for miles. I mean, f f so isolated. And people feel that way, you know? They feel a little isolated here. Uh, when I first got here, my brother called it uh, a city with a small town mentality. And I don't know what the hell he meant. But now I know what he means. Yeah. Well, the fact that he did a lot of drugs and his uh, his uncle, the, uh, the one who uh, committed a murder in front of him, domestic violence, because that domestic violence thing is huge here in El Paso, man. Holy shit. You know, if you could only talk to a cop and you ask him, you know, what are most calls that they get, I'm pretty sure it's uh, domestic violence. You know, drunk driving, a lot of drunk driving here. A lot more, and I mean... I've been cross country. I've been to a lot of cities, man. Uh, for like in the ghetto where I'm from, and like in the hoods and all that, they have liquor stores everywhere. But here, uh, instead of liquor stores, what they have is bars. A lot of bars. It's a bar town. So yeah, you have a lot of people with uh, substance abuse problems and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but it's not very violent though. It's considered the safest, largest city in the country. And it is pretty damn safe. It's like a whole different country compared to where I'm from. You could walk here 2, 3 in the morning. You'd be all right. More than likely, you'd be all right. Very rare for anything to happen to you. But, you know, things happen, of course. Very few incidents, but, you know, it's an American city. What you going to do? All right, but on to the documentary. Let me point out one thing that I initially liked. One of the... Two main cops who, are, who was responsible for capturing Richard Ramirez was Chicano, was Mexican American. I didn't know that, and that's really fucking cool. You know, lately, recently, cops have been getting a bad rap because of those, you know, bad apples. But you got some good ones in there, man. He's one of them. Him and um, his partner, the Italian cop. Uh, he's good. They're both real talented at, at their job. But uh, me, I just like the fact that his background, they explained his upbringing. He went into the military and he was ambitious about um, law enforcement. That was real cool. The one thing they kept bringing up throughout the documentary was Richard Ramirez's uh, shoes, his shoe prints that he would leave, leave behind. I mean, shit, back then, and they show in a documentary, he was real comfortable breaking into people's houses and he would kill them. He didn't care about fingerprints. He didn't care about surveillance. He didn't care about, again, his shoe print. He would uh, eat from their, from their fridge and just hang out like it ain't shit. Well, I guess back then it was just a lot easier to get away with stuff like that. And it shows, man, he didn't care for real. And I thought about that, like, now, 
it's way more difficult and that's real good I mean back in the 80s they didn't have DNA now they do surveillance are you kidding me it's crazy right now people are a lot more aware and uh, here's, here's what I was thinking watching this documentary like people also know how to get away with stuff a lot easier too because of TV shows and movies they, sh they showed all the techniques now that either is going to uh, now that's either going to deter someone because they know that these cops are on their shit like oh man I'm not going to get away with this so I'm not even going to fucking do it or they'll do it and try to uh, cover up their tracks so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing you know but I think more than likely it's a deterrent because we don't have uh, the amount of serial killers we had in the 70s 80s and 90s and stuff that's good shit I hope it stays that way but now we got mass shooters and what we used to before this corona thing but one thing I found kind of weird very odd like this, this is a weird ass fucking story the person he killed in San Francisco and no one no one said anything in the documentary how it's kind of odd this guy's name was Peter Pan that's I don't know that's kind of like did his parents know about Peter Pan and he was Asian but oh I don't know that was it was it's not funny because you know he got killed but it's it is kind of weird and odd you know yeah and uh you gotta love the ending man how it all went down how he tried to steal someone's car in East LA and the whole hood came out and just beat his ass. That was satisfying. Like, they fucked him up. They split his fucking head open. He was running scared and shit, you know? That was that was real cool for people to, to do that. And it, it kind of goes to show you that social media is important, but it's not essential. Because the newspapers, that's what did it. Putting uh, his face on the front page everybody was looking at that paper like and he couldn't even walk the streets pointing at him and he was scared as hell yeah that's real that was real um smart of um of law enforcement to put his information out there unlike uh fucking senator i uh, senator mayor uh diane feinstein god damn lady how the fuck could you do something like that Put out all the information that the cops gave you in confidence and secret. Man, politicians, boy, I tell you. God damn. Both sides are fucking idiots. Different kinds, but still stupid. And Richard Ramirez, at the very end, he poses a question that I've asked before in a different manner. He said if you're, whether you're born evil or made evil see I don't know about that shit but I've asked people if they think that someone is born crazy or made crazy and there's a difference because if you're born crazy you're just born crazy and you might not even care or be aware of it but if you're made crazy you want some retribution you want somebody to fucking uh, answer for why you are the way you are. You might even take it out on society or certain people. So that question uh, I've, I've always wondered about, you know? But yeah, man, this documentary, damn good. From one to 10, 10. There's movies out there. There's so many though, that I don't even know which one to watch because I want to watch the movie now. There's one with uh, Lou Diamond Phillips in it. Yeah, I'm curious about that one. Cause I like him as an actor, so you know he killed that role. I might check that one out. But yeah, that's it for my um, review. As always, stay safe. Make sure to subscribe. And I'll catch you on the next one.